Welcome, everyone, to Nerd of the Rings. Today, we have Mr. Wayne Yip, director of uh, a few episodes of The Rings of Power. Wayne, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. It's a pleasure to be here, Matt. Uh, thank you for having me. Big fan of the uh, big fan of the channel. Oh, thank you. Um, I my first question to everybody whenever they come on is, how were you first introduced to Tolkien? So let's start there. Well, um, I was born and I grew up in Oxford, uh, so I feel that Tolkien was uh, just a tiny part of maybe a little part of my yeah <laughs> am, I allowed to, am i allowed to say that um and uh northmore road where he was residing when he wrote a lot of uh well he wrote all of the hobbit and uh, you know a lot of the lord of the rings was about a block away from my school so uh i while i was reading the books for the first time you know i was imagining that maybe he walked the same streets that I walked when I yeah. went on my way to school. We were looking at the same things. Was he inspired by the same stuff that I was, you know, that was all around me? And, you know, that kind of added to, you know, that made the experience just a, you know, a tiny bit special. Uh, I actually still have my original Lord of the Rings books. Oh, I mean, nice. My third, my third editions. Yeah. Um, and these little price tag on them. They were bought from WH Smiths for £3.10. I think it was about five bucks. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's my uh, that's my introduction. Very cool. Yeah, I love I love the covers on those too. Oh yeah, no, these are yeah they're the same illustrations from the first editions, um, which you know are going for like fifty thousand dollars. Oh each. my gosh! I think these are these are going for like ten dollars each. <laughs> <laughs> they've so they've doubled, doubled your they've money. Doubled in yeah. value. I mean, I'm just gonna hold on to them for that's maybe a still... little bit longer, and you know now that they've been in my possession, they the value has obviously gone down. But, um... <laughs> so uh, I wanted to get into, um, obviously, you know, you being director, we're going to talk a lot about uh, production stuff today. And um, one of the things that stuck out to me in the most recent episode um, was that we got a depiction of Elrond's elven site, mm -hmm. um, which stood out to me because it's it's kind of the first time that we've seen one of these elven abilities play out where we kind of uh experience it ourselves a bit like you know um before we start record or before we start broadcasting here we were talking about uh legolas in the lord of the rings films when aragorn asks him what do your elf eyes see and we just kind of you know it's it's mysterious we don't know what exactly he sees except for what he tells us um, so what were the, the conversations like? How did, um, how did you guys um, go about creating that effect and deciding on, on how to represent that elven site? Um, well, JD and Patrick, uh, the showrunners, they, they'd written that in the script. Like that was uh, always part of the story that, <clears throat> you know, for those that have seen the episode, we're allowed to spoil anything. I guess it's Ed now. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so Deese is lying about where Prince Durin is and Elrond doesn't believe her. And so, you know, there's a kind of, we reveal that he's sort of followed her, but then obviously an elf doesn't necessarily need to be that close. And plus the kind of secrecy of, yeah, of, of um, Casa Dum, maybe Elrond couldn't just be wandering around just like, you know, peering behind a, right. a pillar trying to follow Deesa. So, the, you know, so the, the J.D. and Patrick very cleverly wrote that, you know, that he was much further away and that he was, you know, uh, lip reading this conversation that we led to believers in secret. And then we, mm -hmm. you know, we reveal that Elrond is, you know, has been watching this whole time. And so, yeah, then it was down to, you know, it was it was then up to us to try and figure out what that would look like on screen. You know, in the as you said, in the books, it you know, usually it's, Aragorn or, or or Gandalf saying to Legolas, "What do you see?" And Legolas just yeah, describes right. what he sees. Right. Um, but you know, we couldn't have that because you know, one that would be boring, and two, <laughs> Elrond by himself. Um, so we kind of, you know, we look to you know, with a lot of these, you know, things in terms of the the sort of more fantastical. The one of the, like this is an example. Of one of these fantastical elements that we try to look as much to, you know, to the real world as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and like other, um, you know, birds, eagles, hawks and things that could, you know, could see great distances. Like what what would that actually possibly look like? Mm -hmm. You know, biologically, how would that be possible? And then then how do we then depict that 
on you know on the tv on screen yeah uh, and so what we thought was the most kind of convincing and the most sort of you know visually uh realistic was the sort of the a version of the contra zoom the fact mm -hmm. that we were sort of pulling out while changing focal length which just yeah. kind of made everything just sort of breathe out and sort of bend round as if you're sort of moving through you know squeezing contracting a lens yeah uh and then you know and again it was just sort of like a, a an essence of it the shot doesn't last very long but you kind of get a sense of like that's what sort of might be happening in Elrond's you know actual pov yeah. um uh so yeah so we wanted to we did have a version where it went all the way from Duran's lips and then pulled all the way back. Oh, out. really? Then we that just sort of felt it felt it <laughs> just didn't extreme. feel yeah. It felt it didn't extreme. It didn't also just didn't feel you know quote unquote realistic. And I know realistic is is an odd word to use when we're in you know uh, Casa Dum and watching two dwarves having a conversation. Yeah. Um, but there was always yeah there was always trying to find just that kind of keeping everything just just about feeling grounded and uh and possible was 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 always the goal um, with things like this yeah and now obviously uh don't want to get you in trouble with any spoilers or anything but can we expect to see um any more depictions of tolkien's kind of world of soft magic being displayed um yeah as we get deeper into the story uh there will be a bit more magic reveal okay. but perhaps not in the way that you were expecting okay um, but uh yeah i don't want to i don't want to say anymore yeah don't I yeah we don't want to spoil yeah i don't want don't want anybody coming down on you for revealing too much or anything um so uh sticking with casa doom um the elrond and Durin and uh storyline and the, the whole casa doom storyline i i feel like in my opinion continues to shine um in this series it's it's my favorite of the storylines thus far um, what was it like working with uh, Robert and Owine and uh, Sophia to craft this uh, storyline with so much heart on display? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's 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 so fantastic that that storyline. Um, and yeah, and this and in this case, that old saying that um, directing is ninety percent casting couldn't be more true. I mean, they, yeah, they just embodied their characters so much uh and so really for me as a director all i had to do was just encourage them to you know to follow their instincts uh and to just you know at times just do everything they're doing but just a little bit faster <laughs> which is <laughs> which is always a, which is always a sort of a direction that you end up giving um but yeah it's like they they knew the characters so well they you know they they knew everything about their characters and that just allowed us to you know, to dig deeper and flesh out uh, a lot of great moments, um, you know, all obviously sort of built on top of what JD and Patrick um, had uh, had written in the script. Um, and then also it helped that the, the actors themselves are actually very much like their characters. Yeah. Um, Sophia um, is such a warm and motherly figure. Um, Rob, uh, he knows everything, literally everything about the Legendarium, everything when it comes to Lord of the Rings. I mean, he he possesses Elrond's wisdom and knowledge. And Owain um, lives underground. <laughs> I I did uh, hear that uh, Robert when he when he got the part um, that I I can't remember where I saw this in an interview, but he. He basically said, like, well, Elrond is the lore master. So I felt like I needed to become the lore master. And so he just dove into it, let led like, you know, book studies and stuff on Tolkien. Oh, yeah. His when you rent when you went to his house, it was just covered. The walls were just covered in, you know, in the text and imagery and everything. And also the kind of, you know, for uh, you know, when 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 we're when we're working, we're directing, we you know, when we're working on um on the scenes. And when we're on set, you know, in between the takes, they they're still they still look like their characters, and they still yeah. keep their accents just because it's you know it's it's easier for them not to keep changing their accents in between right. takes. So when I'm giving direction or when we're discussing, you know, what we want to do in the scene, I'm I, I'm discussing it with Elrond, or <laughs> I'm discussing it with Prince Durin. It is it it it's a very very surreal experience, especially for like 
for you know a giant nerd like myself to be able to kind of go over and be like like the times I've accidentally <laughs> called him like Elrond, Elrond what would you think about you know it was just it was a very you know it took, it was a very surreal experience that I was very happy never to kind of feel normal about like it was always it always felt special in you know in, in the most sort of you know strange way yeah um but yeah it was there, there all the three all of the cast all of the cast were absolutely fantastic but you know those three because we did spend quite a lot of time together it was you know it was it was a, it was a real sort of pleasure to watch them all work now um for you personally what what films would you say have most influenced you and what are some of your all-time favorites uh it's a big question um i mean the answer obviously changes depending on who i'm talking to and uh who i'm trying to impress <laughs> <laughs> but uh i think i think two films i think two films that are always in the top five are uh empire strikes back and uh blade runner the final mm. cut um just those films I think just from the pure world building aspects of those films, yeah. um, they both had me hooked from such an early age. I mean, especially Blade Runner in the way that, you know, that so little is actually explained. Um, yeah. But it doesn't seem to, it, it doesn't seem to sort of impact or take away from any of the storytelling. Like the character intentions are also incredibly clear, but there's so much other stuff that just had me coming back constantly to try and sort of figure out what was going on. But it also kind of left the door open for, you know, for my imagination to just sort of, sort of come up with what those things could be. Like, yeah. what's a Blade Runner? <laughs> you know, they never really get into it, you know, and then kind of the, the weird sort of like the street speak and, all, you know, all of that incredible stuff that I was like, oh, what is that? And I need to find out more. And, you know, it just, it, it was such a sort of like a, um, it was such a sort of a compelling uh, experience that you just felt kind of part of when you watched the movie, you felt like you were there. Same with like Empire Strikes Back. It was, they were both worlds that just felt utterly real and yeah. sort of lived in and everything there, even though you didn't understand it, it felt like it should be there. It needed to be there. It should be there. Um, there was sort of logic at kind mm -hmm. of every level, which I thought was just, you know, incredible and sort of like as I grew older and as I sort of you know started to begin to sort of study film a little bit more I still kind of understood that the importance of that especially with these sort of heightened worlds and these sort of you know uh the sort of fantasy genre science fiction genre you know you couldn't just like just throw stuff in there just because it looks nice mm. you know if anything just for the kind of people that are there for me for the actors you know to be in a place and to actually understand why everything is there and why it's there and what it does as well. Like there's so many things that, you know, in Keller Brimble's workshop and all the stuff on the shelves, like every single thing we designed, we all knew what it was. He knew what it was, you know, cause that was so important that when he's walking around his workshop that he knew where everything was and what was under every book and what was under every bit of paper, it just sort of informed the performance and just sort of helped, uh, I think just add for us at least feel like it was just that much more real. Yeah. That's a, speaking of which that's another actor I've enjoyed thus far and it, he's not been in it a whole lot, but Kella Brimbor is one that, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing more from him for sure. Oh yeah. Charlie Edwards. Uh, exactly. It's just such a fantastic actor, a real kind of gravity and him and, and him and Rob as well, just had like a really great chemistry together. You know, it's it's always sort of like you know, it's a challenge to depict, you know, seniority and and else because mm. you know they immortal, you know, yeah, yeah, they're immortal. <laughs> yeah. They all kind of look kind of the same age. So you know, we so we we kind of had to, you know, there were certain things that we had to sort of, I guess, sort of um, lean on the kind of reality that we live in to kind of then un take advantage of what we understand as seniority. Mm. Yeah. And so that we could focus on the character. We could focus on the story and could focus on the characters and focus on not, you know, on what um on what they were actually saying as opposed to getting distracted with like, wait, who's meant to be more senior than the other? Yeah. Um but yeah, we Shepard, but he was but yeah, Charlie's great. We you know, we as always we tried to hire the best actor for each part. Of course. Yeah. And we we got so lucky. Now um 
what was uh, your main focus when setting out to bring to screen something that would feel true to Tolkien's world? And kind of a follow up to that, what, did you find the um, the briefness or the, you know, we, we basically have scattered notes. We, we have very little dialogue from the second age. So there, it's scattered notes. So um, having so little source material, is that more freeing or is it more difficult? Yeah, the records are few and brief. Um, it's both. I mean, it's both um, difficult and freeing because, you know, difficult because, you know, with with this incredible world that Tolkien has created, the stories that he's written, the books and, you know, um, that stuff you 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 know you want to you want to have a, a blueprint you know you want to you want to mine it for every tiny piece of detail and make sure that you're you know doing everything you can to to bring that to screen to bring that you know that 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 spirit to screen i mean in your interview with um lloyd you know he was desperate mm -hmm. to just find a single word that maybe yes. Elendil spoke just to get a sense of the kind of character like you know it's the same with not just characters, but with worlds and with places and with, you know, structures. You just want a single word that you can go, ah, maybe this is, you know, something we could build on to, yeah. you know, to, to, to stay true to what Tolkien had in his head as he wrote, you know, things down or he came up with things or didn't write things down. But then, you know, freeing it when we realized that we were going to be, you know, tackling things that he didn't specifically write about because mm -hmm. you know we were now sort of free from you know from needing to uh needing to be beholden to something written because there wasn't anything written right you know and then we had to kind of really sort of um you know try and sort of try and stay true to what we felt was was in the spirit of you know what he'd written and what he'd um created yeah. Um, so yeah, it was it was it was it was both. It was you know a, a hundred of those uh, of situations like that. You know, yeah. every day, every day, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and yeah, and so uh, yeah, so that was um, that was something you know that uh, that was something that we sort of you know that was one of the main challenges. But you know, we what we wanted to do was to make sure that we you know we stayed true to you know, the, just the kind of the variety of characters and tones that he has in his books, you know, the, the, the kind of heartfelt, but also complex situations and characters, the dark and intense situations, but then, you know, also the whimsical and the funny ones, you know, just being able to kind of hopefully kind of visit all of those different tones um i think was something that we felt was um inherent to his 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 writing and his his characters yeah now um i wanted to dive into um well to to set this up you you have obviously directed a fair amount of what we've seen of numenor mm. uh thus far um which has some really cool uh like the the reveal especially of Numenor uh, was kind of a, a progression of shots that I really enjoyed um, because it's um, it kind of builds uh, for for lack of a better term. <laughs> so, um, what can you tell us about you know the the crafting of the reveal uh, of Numenor and uh, Armenelos, the capital? Um, well, again, it was you know it was it was a it was one of those you know great challenges of translating text to screen and you know even the next stage of that translating script to screen I mean there's the kind of you know the the classic sort of the allies storm the beach for, for <laughs> you know for the war movie and you're like okay what is that exactly and so you know there's the kind of you know Galadriel and Halbrand on a boat enter <laughs> Numenor and see the most amazing thing they've ever seen in their lives and then it's sort of like okay well what is that um yeah so you know ramsey avery uh, incredible production designer his incredible design team uh kate hawley the costume designer the showrunners we all just sat down and started just you know 
and a lot of a lot of us were you know a lot of us were fans that had been thinking up and you know casually dreaming about what this place could be could mm -hmm. look like for the you know the decades the, since we first ever read about them in right. the appendices and the you know somewhere really um and so there was just a lot of ideas there was a lot of ideas on the table and we just sort of slowly started you know promoting some discarding others um and then you know like i said earlier we, we were trying to um ground it in some sort of realistic experience like for instance when you you know arriving to any kind of big port city new york for example mm -hmm. you yeah. don't just sort of turn up and there's the empire state building it's right there you know yeah. it's sort of like you see it in you see it from a distance you see it in parts you see it in you know uh bit by bit as it slowly begins to kind of like unfurl and reveal yeah. itself and that was something that we kind of knew was going to be you know an important part of you know of the scene because you couldn't just go it's Numenor cut to a big wide right <laughs> yeah because you just be like I don't know what I'm looking at I don't you know you want to you know a lot of times it's sort of like it's actually kind of you know you're guiding the audience mm -hmm. to look at specifically what you want them to look at or rather you know discarding things and making you know not showing them things until later when they actually have significance yeah so we wanted to kind of you know we wanted to show that giant scale you know the fact yeah. that the Numenorians were you know at, at the height of their at their powers and their kind of you know and their culture mm. and to sort of almost sort of you know meet their their sort of structures before you met the people I know you'd already met Ellen on a lot of the you know the the sailors right. on the boat but they wanted we wanted to make sure that we kind of really imprinted this sense of absolute grandeur on you know on the audience but also Galadriel and you know and Halbrand Halbrand yeah. you know being someone from the Southlands you think okay he's going to be easy to impress yeah the fact that you know how do we what do we do to impress Galadriel that you know yeah. kind of seen everything at this point and so you know that was something that we wanted to do we wanted to make sure that they felt dwarfed mm -hmm. by these giant statues and these giant structures and then slowly just sort of unveil it so by the time we did cut out to the wide it was you know built up with the music it built up with the expectation it built up with the sort of like the pacing of that um yeah. that reveal and then revealing the um the courtroom later when it had you know again when we had a it had significance to the that part of the story right well and i yeah i like that um you know the the arendel statue kind of gives you a sense of scale you know you you see it as the boat comes in but then it's also in the wide shots so you kind of you you're kind of got a point of reference with uh with the wider shots there yeah and also the kind of sense of like you know the the big the head at the beginning one of the king stones at the beginning that was big mm -hmm. yeah and you got the, the fountain of Ulmo, like well, that was pretty That's big perfect. yeah <laughs> but the bread you're like you think that was big <laughs> um and then we had that kind of you know the beautiful moment where um you know it looked as if the ship carrying Galadriel was was coming into you know was sailing into his hands as if he was welcoming back the elves yeah uh, onto the island um, well that that just reminded me uh I saw on your Instagram you shared some concept art from mm -hmm. that had Ulmo and in the concept art it actually had a sculpture of Yavanna across from Ulmo I believe yeah 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 you, you, yeah, you see yeah there's so many there's so many kind of wonderful details i wish that we had a whole other episode that was just yeah. sort of a guy someone talk, taking you on a, a tour. tour yeah because <laughs> it's all there because again it was you know we we had you know we were blessed with the the time and the resources and also the skill and the passion of these people that we built you know we built that harbor and everything we, we knew all the different quarters there's like the old town there's the elven quarter there's the new part there's the guild part so every we so everything there was a whole reason why everything was there and there was you know all this design that kind of went into all these kind of different sections yeah. um so yeah so we wanted to you know Ulmo, Ul Ul Ulmo was the was the god that gifted them the island so we knew that he was going to be you know up up front and center yeah you know welcoming them welcoming visitors to the island there's a certain pride as well I mean, we imagine in the Numenorean spirit that you know you could see it when Elendil says home yeah that he absolutely loves you know his 
his his uh, his island that he probably absolutely loves. He just knows how awesome it is sailing into, <laughs> you know, sailing into Armenolos. And you know, I think he, you know, he. I don't think he gets over how you know how beautiful that that entry is. Yeah, um, not to mention visitors would have their minds blown. And yeah, <laughs> you know. so I think it's almost like he's. He, Lloyd Lloyd set the bar by giving such an impassioned and amazing delivery of home. Yeah. We were just like, oh God, we've got to make match sure it. Sure. <laughs> yeah, we've got to make sure that you know that it's that it, it matches what he you know is delivering. Um, but uh, but yeah, so there's that, and then you know, and then Erendil, and then um, Elwing on his shoulder. Yeah, and then yeah, yeah, and then at night, I don't know whether you ever see it specifically but we had it so that at night from the from the wharf looking up he looks like he's kind of pointing up to his star oh interesting yeah i don't um, think we've seen that yeah so it all kind of lines up and then you know so there's one of those things where it just we kind of felt like because of all these different bridges that they would have built the statue in a way that you know you could enjoy different aspects of it depending on which bridge you were standing on and what time yeah. of day um so yeah, but I mean, you know, we've got a couple of seasons left. Of, yeah, uh, maybe of we'll Numenor. get to see that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of Numenor, so the other scene that uh, kind of stuck out to me, um, cinematography-wise, was the um, sequence with Muriel having the dream of yeah. the drowning of Numenor, um, and obviously, book fans um, will know the significance of this scene, um, but. Uh, I'm curious to hear about your approach to it. And uh, specifically, I'm, I'm a big fan of like in movies where there's large scale disaster when they shoot from the point of view of people on the ground. And so like I, I love the fact that all the camera angles are from Muriel's perspective. And like you're just you get this sense of impending doom as you're watching through her eyes. Um, so tell us a bit about about that scene. Well, um, well, we knew the importance at that point of the story of when when we learn of almost the burden of knowledge that Muriel has, mm -hmm. and why she's so she's so conflicted about Galadriel being on the island. You know, you could tell that she has something at the end of episode three she says to she goes up to what we find out later as a father and says the elf is here um and so it was important that you know when we finally saw you know i got a glimpse of of uh of her nightmares that we really experienced it from her perspective yeah that we didn't go to some sort of omnipotent eye you know because i think it kind of really took away it, it would have taken away from i think the impact of that you know, as much as possible, we wanted to kind of, you know, we wanted to convey that, that sort of level of sort of destruction and fear, yeah. but from at least from as much as possible, trying to get people to, you know, share in what Mira was possibly feeling. As soon as you sort of pull out and you're, you know, you're miles above the earth and you're seeing everything, tiny buildings being swamped and destroyed. I think it, I think it, 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 it removes you a little bit. Right from it because it sort of changes your perspective to a perspective that you know is beyond probably what we could ever you know experience in our yeah. own lives and so that was something that was um, i think at the forefront of all our kind of decision making of where we were going to put the shots was make it as experiential as possible because we needed to we needed to know that you know especially through that episode that what is constantly playing on muriel's mind and you know what at the end when she decides to initially decides to send Galadriel away, you know, yeah. that, that, she, you know, that, that, that kind of vision of her, you know, beloved Island being completely decimated is as visceral as possible. So that's what, that was what we were trying to accomplish. Very cool. Um, so which uh, rings of power character would you say is your favorite in season one? Oh, uh... I, I don't think I can answer that. I think it's like, <laughs> it's like, choosing, not gonna play favorites. It's like choosing which is your favorite children. I did, did, did Lloyd say that? Uh, <laughs> but maybe, maybe Duran. <laughs> maybe Duran. Okay. <laughs> I think that, well, 
I think I don't think he's my favorite, but I identify with you know okay. I identify with him of the you know or or rather I I I I just I just I'm so sort of I just love the fact that he is torn between you know friendship mm. and duty and you know and 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 also just and I guess rather kind of sadistically knowing what eventually happens <laughs> you know yeah you, I, I guess my I guess my heart just goes out to him and just you know I just want I just want him so badly to make the right decision and to do the you know do all the right things because you know you could just what Owen does and in the you know what JD and Patrick have created in the character is so is so lovable and so warm and you just feel like his heart is in the right place that you just yeah. <laughs> you just want him to you just want him to just stop digging <laughs> Now, um, what what can you tease for us? Uh, again, you know, not trying to get you in trouble or anything, but what can you tease for us for what's in store for episode five coming this week? Um, lots of um, slow motion. Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, um, I'll say um, wolves, uh, swords, and a table. Okay. There we go. Got some pieces to the puzzle there. <laughs> um, so I, I always like to wrap up with some um, some questions, some rapid fire questions for you. So who is your favorite Tolkien character? Um, I'd say Mary Brandybuck. Because oh, he, interesting. He was always, he was always planning. Uh, he was always prepared. And um, I think it was in, is it... Is it like, yeah, right at the end, King Eomir, he gives him the name Holdwine. <laughs> so, okay. like, yeah, like, yeah, a man of my own, a uh, hobbit of my own, of my own heart. <laughs> uh, we've let them come. Which is your favorite Tolkien book? Um, I'd have to say Fellowship of the Ring. Um, it's just that kind of beginning of the adventure, mm -hmm. the kind of leaving the safety of the Shire and stepping out into the big open world, meeting all those characters, you know, learning about the law, um, and obviously Moria, which is incredible. Yeah. Um, so where in Middle Earth would you most like to live? Um, I'm going to say Gondolin. Oh, that's a good um, one. Obviously, while it was there, yeah, uh, just because I just fall, think, yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> pre fall, not not where it's sort of like somewhere at the bottom of you know the sea, yeah. Um, <laughs> the just because I think like if I hung around long enough, there would have been this sort of amazing intersection of these incredible, legendary, yeah, characters. You know, like maybe Glorfindel would have been there. Two or would have, you know, crossed over. Celebrimbor yep. was passing through at some point, yeah. you know, and maybe there would have been a moment where I would have been, you know, could have been there, and they would have all been like, you know, <laughs> hanging out, yeah, hanging together. But I wonder whether all the kind of like the, um, I know it's like famously written that it was like constant bird song and giant mm. fountains. I wonder whether that would just get annoying after a while, uh, yeah, <laughs> or if it would become white noise to you. Um, yeah, I mean, we would yeah. just be stunned by the beauty of it all the time. I'd just be sort of walking around like this. Yeah. <laughs> um, last question: Where in Middle Earth would you most like to visit, but not live? Ah, um, I'm gonna have to say Numenor, mm. just to, yeah. one to see whether we got it right <laughs> with, the, <laughs> with the look. Um, but based on the timeline where we're at at the moment, um, it's probably not gonna be there for much longer so i want to yeah. maybe just get on you know the next uh the next boat out visit visit and then get out while the getting's good yeah yeah before, before things get a little bit wet yeah <laughs> well wayne thank you so much for uh taking the time and uh cool. chatting chatting production with us i really appreciate uh you taking out the time taking the time out of your day today anytime thank you for having me it's been it's been great it's been a pleasure all right guys well thanks for tuning in um, we'll have, of course, our watch party uh, later this week, and we've got a special uh, midweek video, um, a collab with uh, all the other Tolkien YouTubers for Hobbit Day, which is coming up on the 22nd. So look forward to that, and we will see you next time on Nerd in the Rings. Mm -hmm.